All right, supposedly we're streaming right now. This is just a test, a momentary test. Uh, Steven, if you're watching, please give me a thumbs up in Slack. Oh, okay, I just got the notification from YouTube, so I think I think we're good. Is audio showing up? I hope you're getting audio on the stream. Okay. Uh, okay, so, <laughs> my goodness, we're starting late here. We're starting late here. Uh, welcome to MySec Lansing. Uh, let me get rid of this uh, meta, <laughs> meta screen here and go over to our slide deck. Um, my name is Brian Martinez. I'm the uh, MySec Lansing director. Uh, thank you for being patient with us, everyone who's here, everyone who has been waiting for the stream in Slack and on Twitter and everywhere else. Uh, I'll get the stream published on Twitter once I get back to my seat. Um, I'm kind of frazzled right now, so I don't have my usual spiel that I'd like to give. <laughs> I'd like to give, uh, it, but um, I got a great speaker here tonight, Brian Donahue from Red Canary. Uh, we're also streaming live to Detroit at the same time, which is something we've never done before. Um, got to go back to the drawing board, I think, on some of the behind-the-scenes stuff, so we can get started on time next time. But uh, I'm very excited about this. Um, thank you guys for coming out. I'm sorry about the coronavirus. Hopefully, you guys aren't stranded here in Michigan. Uh, <laughs> it's I know I know it's my fault I know um, anyway uh, so I, I'm kind of regrouping in my mind here so um, my sec we're an open community we're an inclusive community we want to build people up we want people in the community to reach out to us and we want to help make those connections help people land in jobs um, you know networking that's that's something that we're, we're very big with um, and and really mentoring and, and things like that as well uh, we do meet here in Lansing every second Wednesday of the month. Uh, we have our social here in Lansing every last Wednesday of the month. Sometimes there's four Wednesdays, sometimes there's five. It's always the last Wednesday. Uh, we have that at Green Dot Stables. Uh, Jackson, their meetup is on Tuesday. We just had theirs last night. Um, and then we have, uh, normally Detroit is separate, but again, they're streaming with us tonight. Hello, Detroit. And tomorrow we have Grand Rapids and Southfield. I don't remember the names of the talks. I'm sorry, everybody in MySec. <laughs> uh, but you can check it out on our website, mysec.us. Um, if you want to sign up for our newsletter, uh, get, get in touch with me here. I'll, I'll get you guys signed up. Uh, if you're not on our Slack, please get on our Slack. I can get you a link for that, too. Uh, very active community on Slack. We've got about 160 regular users, total of around 600 users uh, who come and go as they please. Uh, with that said, I'm going to pass it over to Brian, uh, Brian Donahue again from Red Canary. Uh, he has a great talk here tonight. I'll let him do his own introduction and uh, take it away, Brian. Thank you. All right, my I hope you guys are going to see me momentarily. Uh, just let me know if you can't hear me and I'll stop and start mm -hmm. over. So uh, first thing is... N not a problem. Okay, so let me just take your mic. Now can you guys hear me? Uh, one sec. Testing. Testing, testing. Okay, yep. All right, cool. So um, a couple like caveats, I guess you could call them. Uh, first off, like just taking the pulse of the room. And so we're all on the same page here. Like all of you might be more qualified security professionals than me. So. Congratulations on coming to hear someone who knows less than you talk. Uh, secondly, uh, on a uh, hat tip to my colleagues over here on the sales team, we were joking today, obviously, like with the coronavirus thing and people being kind of freaked out about being near other humans, we uh, were trying to figure out how many people would be here. And we set the, so not including us and Brian, we set the over under at six and a half. And there are six. 
So the over lost. Uh, our best guess was that there would be 10 people here all in. So we nailed it. Uh, so go us. Um, so like, first and foremost, like, um, there is, so when I was talking to Brian, like, he was like, we don't want this to be a marketing talk. And I was like, great, you picked the right person to talk then because I have no interest in talking about sort of like product-wise Red Canary. But in a sense, this is kind of a marketing talk in, in that I am marketing our threat report in a lot of ways, which I think like, you know, you, all, you guys can all have it for free. Uh, so I'm not trying to get money from anybody. But uh, it, we're going to talk about sort of how we think about or how I think about um, sort of threat prioritization. And like a big part of this is going to be discussing MITRE attacks. So like we'll sort of run through that. Uh, and then the other thing I want to say is like when I was planning this talk, uh, I was like, hey, I need to fill an hour. It's probably going to be 20 people there. Um, so I was thinking like it would be more of a, a conversation than me talking at you guys. Um, so like if you don't uh, ask questions and talk to me, like this could end quickly. Uh, so just bear that in mind and like don't hesitate to interrupt me or anything. Um, so without further ado, um, let's get started. So like the not all threats are equal. Like inspiration for this was a talk at AttackCon. So uh, Attack is a taxonomy of threats. We'll get into it in a minute. But they throw a conference every year put on by MITRE, which is a, a government-ish uh, group that does federally funded research facilities. Um, they've got a pretty big presence uh, in the federal government. And then they also created this attack matrix thing. So like I got the idea from this talk um, from a talk my colleague did that was like basically like when MITRE attack hit a fever pitch um, of like everybody adopting it, he was like, well, we should talk about how like you can really mess up your security program with it. And one of the things he brought up was the idea that um, like not each technique in the matrix is sort of equal. Like some of them are very broad, some of them are very narrow, some of them deserve more depth of detection than others. Uh, and some of them, like, you can kind of detect on them if you just have one way of detecting it. Um, so that's sort of the idea for this. Um, so I'm Brian Donahue. I currently work at Red Canary. Uh, my job title at the moment is unknown. Uh, I was in marketing, like, when I came to Red Canary. Um, now I sort of do a variety of things. But the thing I've been working on uh, of late is producing this, this big uh, threat detection report, which show of hands, who here is actually seen the first version of the threat detection report. Excellent. Uh, I will explain what it is. So I, my first job at Infos, I was a creative writing major. So I clearly have chops when it comes to knowing how computers work. Uh, and I started my career as a journalist at ThreatPost. I don't know if you guys have heard of ThreatPost. Um, covered InfoSec at ThreatPost and privacy and national cybersecurity policy, cyber law for like five years. Uh, and then. After that, I was like, you know what, uh, journalists like kind of don't make a lot of money. So I decided that I wanted to go into threat and tell. I did that for a while. And then I've been sort of bouncing around in a, a variety of roles after that. I didn't come up with a fun fact about myself. So we'll skip that. So what in the world is MITRE attack? So I already covered this a little bit. Show of hands. Who knows what MITRE attack is? All right, cool. We're working with a pretty high percentage here. Um, higher percentage for those who can't see the audience than people who uh, had seen the first version of our threat detection report. So MITRE attack is essentially a taxonomy of threats. Here it is. Um, so I think it's 260 some uh, techniques. They're organized like broad adversary behaviors. They're called tactics. They're those, those are the blue ones that run across the top. Um, and then the pillars or, or columns that fall down beneath those are called techniques. Uh, and it's a framework, and it accomplishes many goals. But I would say like the most clear thing it does for me uh, is it takes this very nebulous idea of like a threat landscape and sort of puts bounds on it. So um, like instead of being like the threat landscape, it's just out there in the cloud, right? Like it's like, now nope, there's 260 things. Now, of course, like there is definitely more than 260 things, but like this is probably the best uh, representation of a threat landscape that we've ever had as an industry. And the other thing it does, which is super effective, um, is 
it gives us a common language with which to talk about threats. Like if you spent more than five seconds in threat and tell, you've groaned about naming conventions for threat actors. Well, like surprise, surprise, that's what it used to be like for everything. Like you would have 10 different ways of describing one thing. MITRE came along and was like, here's how we're gonna describe these things. We've all kind of agreed that like, I mean, we haven't by any means all agreed, but like I have accepted, like I'm just gonna go with MITRE's name for it so that we have like a common way to describe things. So you can use it to classify threats. You can use it to communicate about a threats effectively. Um, we kind of use it internally as a way to organize detection coverage. So thinking about like, how do we expand detection coverage or like how do we prioritize moving um, sort of like either getting started with detection coverage or you know, getting better at detection coverage. Um, and then we also use it to produce this report. Uh, oh, did I skip? Yeah, so like I promised you it's not a marketing talk. I do have to explain a little bit of how Red Canary works just so uh, we can all understand like how we gather the data for the report. So um, this particular, these numbers are like out of date at this point. We are, um, like fun fact, we are, I think the last time I checked, we had uh, ingested, so sorry, we ingest raw telemetry from endpoint sensors. We pump it into an engine and we use behavioral analytics or like detection criteria to sort of raise up events that are potentially interesting. And then a team of uh, analysts, we call them detection engineers because they also write the, the, behavior, the behavioral uh, analytics. Um, the detection engineers like investigate, confirm malice, ship detections to customers, okay? So like on a daily basis, uh, I couldn't say like every single day, but the other day I looked and we had processed, uh, processed, I believe it was a petabyte of raw telemetry in a day. So like from that, uh, we raise up, um, so over the, over the report span, 2019, it was uh, six million. So this says investigations performed, I actually, that's an old image. It's, it's, we, I would describe it more as uh, investigative leads. Like if we actually performed 6 million investigations in a year, it would mean that each individual person was doing 15,000 investigations a day. And that's simply not possible. Like there's a lot of automation involved. Um, but like we call them detectors. So like we raised 15 or 6 million events. Uh, some of them handled by bots, many of them handled by humans. Those were then condensed down to 15,000 like properly confirmed threats. That does not include um, detections associated with potentially unwanted programs like Abware, we just sort of excluded those from the report um, because it's called the threat detection report. And we were like, well, is a pup a threat? I mean, it depends who you ask. Some people don't care, some people do. So we, we skipped them out. Um, so like that's sort of how the product works, how we get the data for the report. So, um, and like from a high level, the point of it is uh, the question that we kind of get asked I would say like most often by people with regards to attack is like, how do I get started with attack? And this report, the, this is the first version of it here. Uh, the new version like doesn't have a downloadable thing. It's just a website because it's 2020 um, and we don't need PDFs anymore. Uh, so the, the broadest point of the, the report was to answer like, how do I get started with attack? Which to me personally is like kind of like asking um, how do I expand my detection coverage? Because that's sort of the way we think about it. So we wanted to go in and say, all right, getting started, the if the point of attack, like from a tactical level, is to um, help organize the way you're gonna, you're gonna expand your detection coverage, then you need to know like what should you detect. So like going back, like you could endeavor to turn all of these boxes green in the sense that like, I want to add one detector or one way of detecting each technique technique in this matrix. Um, but like one, it's probably impossible. Two, as you might have guessed from the title of this, like not all of these techniques uh, deserve equal attention. So we tried to figure out like, well, which one is the most important one? Um, so the idea was like we we at the detection layer, like those behavioral analytics that, that our detection engineers are creating, whenever we create one, we say, okay, this is looking for you know X behavior. What miter attack technique does that is that associated with? So each of these detections or, or detectors is tied to a miter attack technique. Um, and then when we ship it to a customer, like maybe four or five detectors are involved in that. Uh, like the 
the event that the analysts uh, analyzed w maybe was associated with multiple methods of finding this stuff. So like there could be five or six MITRE ATT&CK techniques that are associated with any threat detection that we send to a customer. So we counted them and we made a list of what are the top most prevalent um, threat techniques. Uh, and the idea is to like sort of guide people if they're expanding their detection efforts or to help them um, like get started with detection efforts. Uh, and then like within the report, we tried to answer some questions about like, well, why is a technique prominent? And um, like how do you detect it? Which is probably like, I think at least two of you said that you are security engineers. Like that's the part of the report that you're probably gonna be most interested in because it's basically like without publishing the code, um, we are essentially saying like, here is exactly how you would go about trying to detect uh, common classes of attack that fall under this technique. Uh, the other thing we have, so like, we got much gra more granular about the data this year, and now we're able to look at the way that attacks happen together. So like, you know, you don't just see PowerShell, right? You see PowerShell happening as part of a spear phishing attachment. So we sort of um, looked at co-occurrence, like which MITRE attack techniques occur together in a threat to try and figure out, like tell a better story or a broader story about like sort of what's going on. Um, so like, you know, we've got year over year, so the report looks at 2019, but we compare it to the same period from 2018, just so you can see year over year tr trending, um, common co-occurrence we already went over. <laughs> so the additional research section is uh, funny. So we, the first time we looked at all of the data, we were like, oh, this is interesting. Like a ton of detections in a very small number of environments are skewing our results. So we had like a data scientist who was like, well, why don't instead of counting by raw volume, we'll count by customers affected. So we created this whole report based on counting by customers affected. Um, and then we got to like the, the finish line, like we were done with the thing and we talked about it. And like, we were like, man, we, we really outthought ourselves on this. Like that's really confusing to count that way and call it prevalence. So we were like, all right, let's go back to counting by raw threat volume. We rewrote 40% of the report. And then we were like, well, what should we do with these other techniques that we wrote up that are still interesting? Like things like credential dumping fell out. And it was like, well, I think that's an important technique, right? Like to the point you were making earlier, I promised I wouldn't bring this up, but I'm bringing it up. Like credential dumping is on that list in no small part because of tools like Mimikatz. And when someone executes Mimikatz on your environment, like you want to be able to detect that. That is bad. So, um, so we just added an additional research section where we have like three extra or four extra techniques um, that are like, they're all in the top 20, but like it goes from the top 10 being completely filled out and having analysis for each one to like 11 and then 13 and then 20. So eventually we'll probably fill in the whole top 20. Um, and then the, the bit about actionable insights is literally just like, what sources do you need to be collecting on? Uh, what log sources should you be collecting from? to observe this stuff and like what particular like analytics within those data sources are gonna be useful for building detection. Um, so I should note, and it, I may be getting ahead of myself here, but we run everything essentially based on endpoint. So like this list is very, very much so uh, influenced by the fact that all of our visibility is endpoint based um, and like the detection guidance in here is going to be much more practical and much more useful for you if you run detection on endpoint. Like, I'm not sure how much of this is gonna be super useful uh, if you're gathering telemetry from network sensors, frankly. So, as you might have guessed, the number one threat is process injection. So like, within each technique, we tried to say like, okay, well, why is process injection the number one technique? And the answer for process injection, along with at least three other techniques in our top 10, is singularly because of TrickBot. Um, like, just, so we, we have two sort of categories of customer, right? Like, we have customers who we monitor full time and where, like, uh, we're constantly looking for, but not necessarily expecting there to be security incidents. And then we have IR engagements where, you know, by default, we know that something bad has already happened. Um, and those IR engagements, like the thing that 
I don't know if I would say that, that the thing that happens most often is they get like hit hard by Emotet and then Emotet drops TrickBot and then we come in and try and clean it up. But like certainly in terms of the number of detections overall, like if you took everyone together, like that's what happens. So we end up responding to a lot of TrickBot and um, like the way that TrickBot runs arbitrary code through the Windows service host uh, is mapped to process injection, uh, the way that we've mopped, mapped our MITRE attacks. And so like process injection therefore is our number one threat. So like, yeah, as I said, like the layout of the report is basically 10 technique sections, 13 I guess because of the additional research. And each section tries to answer like why do adversaries use this technique? how do adversaries use this technique, which is might maybe kind of a nuanced like distinction that I should probably explain, but it's basically like, you know, what specific behaviors and threats are doing this. Um, and then we go into collection sources, which is kind of easy because, and this may be my favorite part about MITRE ATT&CK, is for every technique, they have a list of data sources that you would collect logs from in order to observe that. So we, we basically look at MITRE's data source list, we say, okay, are there any other data sources that MITRE doesn't have? If there are, we say you could also collect from this data source to, to see it. And then we sort of think about like, well, which one is like the most important? Um, and then from there we go uh, straight into detection strategies. Sorry, I didn't realize that this thing was here. I don't know why that's happening. Sorry, I haven't used a Windows machine in a very long time, so uh, we're gonna have to cope with it. Uh, it's fine. There's nothing important down there anyway. Um, so, really though, the point of all of this is kind of a discussion about threat modeling, right? So like, the question is that I would want to ask is like, which threats do I care about? Do I care about the things that are the most severe? So like, um, credential dumping is a good example of that. Like, when credentials get dumped, that is by default very bad. It might not be the most likely thing to occur, but it is the most impactful, well, not the most, but it, you know, it's, it could be potentially one of the most impactful things to occur when it does happen. The same is basically true of like a wiper. Um, you know, maybe your threat profile is such that you don't have to worry about that all of the time, but like if it happens, it's very bad. Um, so would you want to prioritize something that's unlikely but severe over something that's common? So like, common threat, like, you, you're basically all but certain that it's going to happen. Uh, but, like, when it happens, it's not the end of the world. And then, on, on, as the third option, like, or do I want to think about threats that target organizations like mine? So, like, now I'm going to ask you all, like, first off, like, which of these three things would you prioritize first? And second of all, outside of these three things, like, what are other ways of thinking about threat prioritization that I've not considered here. Yes? Yeah, so uh, to summarize, if you couldn't hear, um, she said that basically you would want to have the best detection for the severe threats, but you'd also want to detect like low level common things because they can be indicative of problems with I would, you know, your IT hygiene that are going to cause probably more severe threats to become problems down the line. Uh, and I think that that is, so it's a good segue uh, because the first one we're gonna talk about is sort of by severity. So. Um, that is a good point, and I should caveat that like we've excluded detections for potentially unwanted programs and, and adware from this report, not because we don't think that they're important. Like, in fact, we think they're very important, and part of our philosophy is exactly what you just said, which is like, if you are um, if you are not 
tuned to detect silly little things like people using caffeine or you know uh, dumb toolbars that are injecting ads into your your browsing like if you're not able to detect that stuff then like it, there's a high likelihood that you know you're going to face more severe threats and in fact we I really wish that I could remember this statistic but we just published a blog like a month ago where we did uh, some math around like what was the likelihood that you would get a malicious detection if you had never had a unwanted. So the three categories we have are malicious, hot, like the we know it, we're 100% certain it's evil, um, suspicious, which is like we're reasonably certain that this is, I mean, more than reasonably certain, like we're almost 100% positive that this is bad, but we can't really tie it to a specific tool. So that's like if, uh, like a false positive in that case would be like, you know, maybe your sysadmin is like getting a little bit too creative with PowerShell and we're like, kind of looks like an adversary. Um, and then the third category is unwanted detections, which is just adware. So uh, we posted this blog about how uh, like just basically trying to crunch the numbers of like, is it actually the case that uh, if you have unwanted detections, you are then more likely to have malicious detections than people who don't have unwanted detections at all? And like, there was a clear um, correlation there. Like it, the answer to that question was yes. I don't remember exactly the math, but uh, it was statistically significant, I believe. So by severity like we're talking about like existential threats here i kind of already talked about these two things but like things like credential dumping and things like disk content wipe um, or wipers like i just called it disk content wipe because that is the miter technique name so just trying to stay uh true to my claim that i try to use their their language rather than my own um and like so maybe these things aren't totally likely to occur but like also, maybe you want to build 70 ways of detecting uh, credential dumping, like something like maybe like domain trust discovery, like you might only need one way to detect that, right? Like, but for something that's potentially an existential threat, like you're going to want a good depth of coverage, which sort of comes back to the idea I got at the beginning of this talk, which was that like, you can't just flip every box from blank to green and say, all right, like I've got one way of detecting all 266 techniques, like I'm good to go because there's more than one way to dump credentials, right? Um, so the other way of looking at it, of course, is by prevalence, which is primarily how this report uh, looks at things. Although I think that we, in counting two ways, we were able to sort of uh, do like editors choosing and p also pick out some techniques that like maybe weren't uh, as prevalent in terms of volume, but like still warranted some level of, of discussion and, and analysis in the report. So like with this, like stuff like PowerShell, like happens all the time. PowerShell might actually not be the best example for this because like you can do a lot of really, really uh, malicious things with that. But the idea here is like, should you prioritize things that happen all the time or should you, you know, think about things that are, are totally severe? So, like, the answer is probably both, um, but, like, how you strike a balance between those things is, is difficult. And I think that, like, one thing that's very helpful about this sort of report, and we're certainly not the only people who write reports like these, um, I think ours is the best, selfishly, but, uh, like, the, it helps you figure out, like, we all can figure out what things are, like, really bad when they occur, right? Like, we read the news every day. The news only wants to talk about things that are super bad, like not Petya and, like, you know, the city of Baltimore getting completely hit and, and ruined by ransomware and then having to burn down their whole network. But, like, those things aren't crazy common. Like, how many... You don't have to raise your hand for this, but how many of you have been in an organization where, like, you've had to burn the whole thing down because the whole thing got ransomed? No one's raising their hand, so I'm assuming that means no one, but I don't know that that to be the case. I would rather you not admit it if that had happened. Um, so, like, here's our top 20 in terms of um, in terms of total volume of threat. So, like, yeah, what's up? Yeah, sorry. 
it's blocked. This thing? This thing. Nah, that's the full screen thing. I assure you. What if you hit uh, the play button? Oh, you're probably right. No, never mind. So anyway. Oh, oh God. Yeah. What have I done? So anyway, uh, what you guys can't see is that uh, number 20 down here. Here, you know what? Uh, I don't know what. Windows, for God's sake. <laughs> Uh, anyway, like uh, number 20 here is spear phishing attachment. You'll have to take my word for it. 10 is, boy, let's see if I can remember. 10, I believe, is disabling security tools, which is a fascinating. This is a total sidebar, but I'm going to go down this road anyway because why not? Uh, disabling security tools is super interesting because it's like, how do you detect disabling security tools? Like, you have to look for the absence of data. So, like, yeah, what's up? Exactly, yeah, but, but it's, so, uh, of course, there are ways to detect on it, but it's also, like, it's very different than every other thing you're going to try and detect for, where you're like, I'm looking for something anomalous in the logs. It's like, you're looking for the absence of the logs at all. Um, anyway, sidebar, over. So, like, uh, looking at this top 20, and I'm asking you this, like, kind of so that I can answer, be prepared to answer this question if... People ask it of me when we actually release the report. Like, is there anything in this top 20, 10 is credential dumping, 20 is spear phishing attachment, that uh, seems like you're like, why is that there? We all able to read it. Accessibility features is an interesting one. Oh, man, you picked out the one that I literally don't, I, I literally don't know why that one is there. <laughs> Let's focus on the top 10. What did you say? Oh, sorry. Yeah, he he, uh, he guessed accessibility features, um, which I we didn't analyze it yet, so I'm not sure off the top of my head why that's there. Um, but like process injection, I can say trickbot scheduled task. Any guess? If you had guessed, what's your guess? So it's like the process Yeah, it's a persistence mechanism for sure, but it's a persistence mechanism for Classic. TrickBot. What's TrickBot, like? TrickBot is a, an information stealing trojan. So, um, the in a typical infection cycle, what you will see is Emotet drops TrickBot, like one or both of them do a variety of lateral movement. Um, and then, like, the next stage in that attack is occasionally TrickBot will then drop. Actually, I'm not sure, like, just candidly, I'm not sure if what, do, what drops what. But um, then either Emotet or TrickBot will occasionally then drop Ryuk, the ransomware. So it's like move laterally, steal some more credentials to move laterally with TrickBot. Um, and for whatever other purpose, whoever's controlling it wants to steal credentials for. Uh, and then you drop Ryuk uh, and you ransomware everything. So like the reason that we mostly see TrickBot, as I suggested earlier, is because of IR engagements. So like if someone tries to execute Emotet on its own, we're very good at detecting that. We have a very good shot of detecting it and stopping it before it gets to the TrickBot phase. However, we're often dropped into environments where like we're well past that point and we're well on the way to like Ryuk happening. Um, so like going through like process injection, scheduled task, to some degree PowerShell, although PowerShell is much more dynamic than that, and there's a lot more reasons why that's on this list. Um, and then I think probably disabling security tools and domain trust discovery are all ta techniques on this list that in some small or large part are there because of TrickBot. Um, and then stuff like Windows admin shares, remote bio copy are there um, because of sort of, I, I would say because of Eternal Blue, but what I really mean is like, Things like Eternal Blue. What's up? So if a TrickBot goes in and I guess the TrickBot drops off the exploits, so they drop the exploits or whatever. So uh, that's a, I'm, I'm not, so you asked if TrickBot drops exploits. Like, I, I don't know 100%. I know that it leverages many of these techniques. Um, I think, in like anyone in here who's done an incident, an actual incident response engagement on TrickBot might be able to answer this question better. I, my, I think 
it generally comes in by way, so emotech comes in by way of like a malicious spear phishing attack, like a malicious document gets, I don't spear phishing. I generalize because we look at endpoint data and we can't really tell the difference between normal phishing and spear phishing, but like let's just assume that we're talking about phishing. Um, so it'll get dropped as part of like a, an attachment and the attachment probably runs a macro, the macro probably executes PowerShell, which then drops emotet and then um, like once TrickBot is dropped, like, I don't know if it, like, in terms of exploit of, like, exploiting a vulner vulnerability, like, I'm not sure. Does anyone here know? Yeah. Um, but I do know that it, you know, it, uses, it injects itself into processes and it, um, you know, uses scheduled tasks for persistence. Um, it does domain trust discovery to, like, sort of figure out, you know, which computers have access to what systems to help it move laterally, uh, I believe. I'd have to fact check myself on that. Um, so anyway, that's the top 10. Like if you were gonna look at things in terms of prevalence, like and you were like, man, I, you know, I'm looking at MITRE ATT&CK to try and figure out like where I should get started with detection. Like if you were like, what, which process or like which technique should I try to build detection for first? I would be like, well, process injection, right? Like that's what's, you know, if, if if that's a good way of catching the thing that we think happens most often, then that's probably a good place to start. What's up? So, um, wouldn't it be better to just, I mean, I'm not entirely sure, but um, the, the most common way these are delivered is through like phishing, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'm glad you asked that because I actually got this question asked like two days ago. And if you had asked me before this other person asked me the same question, I would have fumbled over my words. But I do have an answer. And the reason, and I've, already, I've actually already answered it twice, the reason is because we are not often seeing that part of the attack, right? We're seeing the follow-on part that's where the breach has already occurred. Breach, it's kind of a loaded term. Like the infection has already occurred and we are coming in uh, to do incident response and clean it up. So I think that that's a very reasonable way to think about it. And we have talked internally like about, well, what if we struck out all of our incident response engagements from the data set so that we were looking at a more like a more full sort of, uh, I guess you could say like detection life cycle where we've got like, we're there, we're watching constantly instead of like we get thrown into an environment where like something very, very bad has already happened. So I, I think that's a reasonable question to ask. Um, and like, if I have my way, I will have a toggle in next year's report that's like, I want to see what this looks like if we don't include incident response engagements. Does that make sense? What's up? Can you repeat the question you just answered? Oh, sorry. So, yeah, yeah. So he asked um, if TrickBot, you know, whether it's tied, you know, if you look at the full infection life cycle of TrickBot and like whatever launches it starts with spear phishing, then why isn't spear phishing number one? And the answer is because we're being dropped into incident response engagements where that part of the infection has already occurred. Um, so then like the other way of looking at it is like, or should I do threat modeling based on the kind of threats that are, are my peers are facing? Um, so we, tried to split all of our customers up into industry so that we could tell a story about this. And I have to tell you guys that uh, assigning industries to companies and assigning and determining the list of industries like in total are two challenges that I hope none of you ever have to face because it's one of those things that sounds super easy, but is in fact very, very difficult. Um, and there are like standards, like there are these things that are called like in, I think they're NAIC, N-A-I-C-S codes. Um, and they're like these, you'll have to forgive me because I don't remember exactly, but they're like, they can be like seven digit long codes. And they apply to every company, uh, essentially every company. And like, if you subtract two of those digits, 
you get a smaller list of industries. So like the complexity and the number of industries increases as you add more numbers. So you might be a tech company, like if you've got five digits, if you're looking at the first five digits of the NAICS code, like you're in tech. But if you add two more digits, you might be in like aeronautical engineering or something. So like very difficult. Uh, I spent endless hours trying to figure this out. We did a fine job, I'm sure, although I, I guarantee people would nitpick. So like we ended up with, with I think, I, I literally counted this like an hour ago, I think we came up with, we included eight industries. And the reason we had eight is not because we chose eight in total, like we chose probably like 20, but when we looked at the data, we were like, all right, you know, we're a, kind of a smallish company. So like uh, when we look at all of our customers together, like lists make sense. Like we have a, a volume of data that's high enough that um, we can say like, you know, this top 10 makes sense. Like this is a statistically significant sample size and like we're all good. However, when you split us up into industries, sometimes you get like really, really weird stuff. So we basically set a baseline. Don't remember what that number was, but we were like, you need to have X number of detections throughout, throughout the whole year for us to consider your top 10. So we came up with, um, oh, you guys can't see the bottom one again. It's disabling security tools. Uh, so we had education, we got finance. So that bottom one is, oh boy. process injection. Uh, healthcare, that's domain trust discovery on the bottom there. Uh, network shared discovery is on the bottom for manufacturing. Retail is, I believe that is spear phishing attachment. That one's process injection again for services. Services admittedly is like kind of a lot of different things. Uh, and then technology. Uh, and that bottom one is either, I think it's masquerading. So like, you asking a question? Um, so like, this might be another good way to uh, sort of think about the things you want to detect. And uh, at AttackCon, I listened to a talk by a couple guys at Nationwide who were like just getting started adopting attack and just getting started, like getting really serious about expanding detection coverage. And the way they did it was they basically went into MITRE ATT&CK. They, well, first they identified threat groups, like named threat groups that were targeting companies like theirs. So I think they said they came up with like, I can't remember if they said 17 or 32, but somewhere between 17 and 32 threat groups. And then they went into MITRE ATT&CK, so I didn't mention this earlier, but MITRE ATT&CK also includes like for every technique, if you're like PowerShell, there is a table uh, on the PowerShell page in MITRE ATT&CK that will show all of the threat groups that leverage PowerShell. So they took their, you know, 20 to 30 threat groups. They then wrote down all of the techniques that those groups are thought to use, and they ended up with a list of 91 techniques, and they built out their detection for those 91 techniques. So that's like the most interesting way, uh, and, and probably one of the cleverest ways I've, I've heard of thinking about like sort of how you would build out detection for um, a new detection program if you're getting started with MITRE ATT&CK. So like sort of other information sources that I would encourage you all to look at, like Carbon Black puts out Great resources, especially if you're in the business of endpoint telemetry. Um, MITRE ATT&CK, obviously, like half of this conversation has been about them. Um, CrowdStrike does great reporting. Most of their stuff, a lot of their stuff is like state level, so it's like both uh, good to know about and also like just fundamentally interesting. Like you want to read about it because you're like, wait, why is China hacking, you know, pharmaceutical companies and, you know, in the Southeast? Um, so M-Trends is another, that's uh, Mandy and FireEyes sort of annual report. And then the two bottom ones there are SecureList, which is Kaspersky Labs research website. Um, they do a lot of really good state level adversary reporting. And then the last one there is uh, Cisco Talus Group. Obviously this is a very limited group of, of uh, logos that I could fit on this one slide. Um, and I didn't add a second slide. So does anybody have any questions? Because those are all the slides I have. Yes? Can you take a look at the MITRE framework? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I meant to do that. Yeah. 
Let's do it. If the internet works here. Um, okay, so it's attack. CLM. Oh, no. Uh, there we go. Here, no, that is, so like, I'm not going to actually talk about that. Never mind. <laughs> Miter attack is hot, guys. So hot, in fact, that many companies are. Yeah, you're right. Yep. It's probably wrong in my slides. Uh, so anyway, like, there are multiple different Miter attack matrices. They have one for industrial control systems. They have one for mobile. There's uh, within the enterprise, there's pre-attack. Um, and then, like, the one that we're really talking about, though, is the enterprise matrix. Um, so as you can see, like, these across the top here are tactics, um, sort of like the broad objectives that an adversary might have when they're uh, doing an attack. So, like, the first one is initial access. And I'm reasonably certain that this all sort of maps to the Lockheed Martin kill chain, the, the tactics at least. And then, you know, coming down from the tactics, you have techniques. So like PowerShell, uh, actually I like, I kind of like scripting. So um, scripting is my favorite MITRE attack technique. Uh, so like you come in here and as I said, like you've got data sources, like if you want to observe an adversary scripting, like process monitoring, file monitoring, process command line parameters, all things that you would get from most endpoint detection and response agents. Uh, are things that you would want to look at to see someone leveraging scripting. And then as I was saying before, like procedure examples is what they call for like sort of named groups that uh, that use this stuff. So like this is a mix obviously of A groups and B threats. So like some of these are, are malware, some of them are uh, are like threat groups. And then they also have down at the bottom mitigation ideas. Um, and detection ideas. So that is the MITRE attack matrix. Anything else? What's up? So you were talking about how um, you don't want to have a, a new checkbox across all of them and how to say that, oh, you know, we covered all possible threats. But what about the idea of if you go back to the matrix, you know? Mm -hmm. Drive by compromise. Oh, I mean, I mean like the, the call by compromise. Oh. Yeah, it's a tactic, right? If I say I want to cover all possible ways of initial access, mm -hmm. right? Um, shouldn't that be a good idea for when you're trying to prevent, you know, attackers from from probably the only thing you probably can't do is one. Like, I'm just thinking of if you try to rob a bank, right? And um, you go into the bank, and you just make sure the bank, you go into the vault. When you go into the vault, it locks you. Uh huh. Yeah, but what if you're what if you're so the question is like why not just start with initial access, prioritize initial access, and if you can keep people from getting initial access, then like, um, what? Why would you have to do anything else? And I mean, conceptually, I think that's a good question. But like, what if so an example I used is like your bank vault? Like, if the bank vault locks whenever you go inside of it, then why does it matter? But it's like, what if I dig a big tunnel? drill underground and enter your bank vault through something that's not the front door. Yeah. Like your whole threat model just went out the window. Yeah, um, yeah, I mean like so yeah, exactly. So the the other, so she said, what about insider threats? Which is a good point. Like, but even so, like, let's ignore that, right? Like, are we going to build our whole threat model around the prospect of an insider threat? No, right. 
So like your point's still valid, I think, despite the fact that insider threats are very real and fairly common. Um, but there's all sorts of stuff running on your Windows system that doesn't care about front doors. Like you, you've got processes that can reach out to the internet and download things that are whitelisted by default. Like uh, Red Server 32 is it, like Squibbly Do is a good example of this that can like pull down things from the internet that you don't like. There, it's not an initial. I, I don't think that's initial access. I think that's probably execution. But still, the point is like there's all sorts of living off the land techniques that that don't care about initial access. The initial access has already happened. Windows, Microsoft built the initial access into the operating system, right? Um, so, but even, even if we say that is the right way to go about it, like you've still got, you know, 15 or 20 different techniques there. Like maybe that is a way you look at it. Like you're like, we're gonna start, we're just gonna go across the kill chain. Like once we cut off initial access, then we're gonna move on to the next one. But it's like, how do you decide which one of the initial access things to start with, and how do you decide how much coverage you need for each technique? I mean, that's what, yeah, I mean, that's the way I think of it, but I certainly don't have, I don't know what the right answer is to these questions, right? I think that's a good answer. <laughs> yeah. Any questions from uh, the, the internet or our friends in Denver, or Detroit, sorry, D cities. <laughs> Well, whoever you are, if you get the courage to, to write your answer, do so. Red Canary? Yeah. Uh, we do ma manage detection and response. So we partner with endpoint agents, but we don't really have our own. Yeah. Like, yes. So sorry, I keep forgetting to repeat questions. So the question was about what Red Canary's product does. Uh, and then the follow on was about endpoint agents missing things like spear phishing. Um, so yeah, I mean, like there are things that a spear phishing attack would do that at an endpoint that you would definitely be able to observe on an endpoint. But um, yeah, I mean like an email filter might be a better way to detect a spear phishing attachment or prevent it, right? Um, like t to detect it on an endpoint, like I'm, there's probably many ways to do it, but like you would have to sort of wait for something to get executed or for someone to open an attachment. Um, and like you definitely wouldn't want to build a detection that, or you wouldn't want to base detection, right, on, at least I don't think you would. Like feel free to tweet at me if you think what I'm saying is stupid. Um, but like, you wouldn't want to be like, I want to know every time someone opens an email attachment, right? You'd have like 60,000 alerts a day, uh, depending on your enterprise size, obviously. Um, but like, you know, maybe you do want to know if like a macro launches or, or like a, a process that is Microsoft Office launches a process that is PowerShell, right? Like, I don't know of a legitimate use case for uh, having a, a Word document launch PowerShell. I mean, I'm sure there's some sysadmin out there who's gotten really crafty about how he uses PowerShell, but I don't understand why you would do that. Anything else? We've gone a whole hour. I'm shocked that this lasted this long. Yeah, so um, someone from Detroit uh, says they want to know about the now service. Uh, so you might want to repeat this too, just so they know. Okay. Uh, does it still happen often? How severe and how to respond? So the question is, do denial of service attacks still happen often? Uh, are they severe and how do you respond? The answer to the first part of that question I would say is like, candidly, I don't know. Uh, when I was a journalist, they happened all the time. I think that like companies like, and I am speculating pretty wildly here, so like understand that, like don't quote me here. But uh, I think that like companies that are in the business of, of mitigating DDoS attacks have like gotten much better at it. Like the Cloudflares and the Akamai's of the world and the Googles uh, have sort of figured out how to mitigate these things. Like, I it, it's certainly not the sort of thing that you would commonly see if your point of if your point of view is endpoint centric, right? Like, I don't know that you would be DDoSing an endpoint like unless the endpoint that you're talking about is a server that hosts a bunch of websites 
Um, so we certainly don't observe a lot of DDoS attacks. Like anecdotally, um, other than my like ratchety credit union that I use that seems to be constantly suffering from DDoS attacks, like I don't really even read about them in the news that much. Like I could be wrong. I could be overlooking something. Um, but like if you were like, what's the most significant example of a recent DDoS attack? I would be like, uh, probably in 2012 when the you know groups suspected to be tied to the Iranian government were like DDoSing all of the banks. Like that's kind of the last, I wouldn't call it the last hurrah of DDoSing, but it's like the most significant example that comes to mind and that was eight years ago. So I hope that sort of answer, well it doesn't answer your question, but uh, I would suggest that like if you want to learn more about how to detect and respond to a DDoS attack, like Red Canary is probably not the expert source that you would want to go to. Like maybe you go to Akamai or Cloudflare or Google has, Google built like a really interesting one where like they were offering like self-publishing journalists um, DDoS protection services for free. Like it was around, now that I'm thinking about it, like the last recent DDoS attack I can think of is like when Brian Krebs' site got knocked offline for something he did. Um, so like, I remember like Google offering him protective services because like Cloudflare or uh, whoever was doing his um, DDoS mitigation at the time was like had been doing it pro bono. I think again, don't quote me. I'm going from memory here, but they were like, "Look, we can't dedicate resources to your website because like you don't pay us one and two, or maybe you don't pay us enough and two, like um, y people are constantly DDoSing you, and it costs us a lot of money to maintain that." So. So Google offers it for free, I think, um, to certain people in like high risk groups. So I would start like with those resources. If you want to learn about endpoint based detection, like Red Canary is your, your company, but not for DDoS. Another question, uh, what do you enjoy most about your current position, which is undefined or? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So the question is, what do I enjoy most about my current position? And the answer that came from my friend on the sales team is the autonomy. Uh, I would like the official record to state that I do not have autonomy. I diligently work uh, all of the time. So I, uh, I have always liked trying to figure out like what people should care about in security. Like what, like, what are the, like, because I remember when I was doing threat and tell and definitely when I was doing journalism, like people would get wrapped around the axle about like, um, like, you know, Fancy Bear or like, you know, the, the People's Liberation Army like hacking them. And it's like, well, you got to ask yourself, like, do you make the best missiles? Because if you make the best missiles, then maybe you should be concerned about, you know, the Chinese military hacking you. But like, uh, if you make solo cups, like, maybe, maybe they don't care that much. I don't know. Like, so like trying to think about like what, what you should be concerned about. I also like, um, so I actually don't speak much. This is like the second time I've ever sp spoken to a group. But uh, I'm increasingly interested in like sort of going out and talking about this stuff. And I really like writing and sort of telling stories on the blog. So I would say that those four things or three things are what I like most about my role. assuming the Chinese government wants this? And they're like, oh, yeah. Like, because it's, you know, it's agriculture stuff. Yeah. Right? And I'm like, I go, to me, it looks like p pictures of grass, right? And they're like, how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> the, so the, so. the funny thing about that is, like, so I make a joke about, like, if you make solo cups, there's a reason I made it that we won't get into here because we were talking about solo cups before we, we got started here. But uh, the other thing is, like, but, like, don't take my word for it on that. Like, I don't know what the interests are of the Chinese government. Like, they tried to steal the color white from DuPont. I don't know if you guys read that article, but they legit hacked into DuPont to steal their, uh, I, I believe, to steal their um, sort of compound that they used to create white paint. And I'm like, I don't know why they did that. They're also thought to have hacked into, um, God, some health insurance company. I can't remember what it was, but it was like the the big hack of like 2015 or something. And it's like, why are they stealing information from a health insurance company? Like at the time, the best answer I ever got is because they had an aging population and they were trying to figure out how to do better at healthcare. 
Um, but I don't know, like, why did they break into the OPM? Nobody knows the answer to that question. I mean, obviously that one's pretty out. Like that one, I, I get it. Like, <laughs> I know why you would want to break into the OPM. Like they have everyone's classified, like clearance information. Like you could first off figure out all those guys who claim to work for the State Department who, you know, are don't like, right? The guys who like are CIA agents embedded there. You could also figure out all sorts of compromising information about people. So that makes sense. But like, you know, I don't know. It's hard to, to understand why any like national government does anything. Like why are their interests the way they are? It's not always, there's not always a clear answer. Any? Feel, feel free to ask away. So I would say generally, like, oh, sorry. So the, the, the question was, like, if it comes in, like, if we get, like, an initial access uh, technique, so, like, if an adversary uses a spear phishing attachment um, to initially access a, an environment, like, is it from there, are we, like, more likely to see, um, like, is it, like, is there, like, a clear path that's likely to occur through this matrix? And, like, the answer to that question is a total cop out, uh, and it's kind of yes and no, right? Like I would say, like if you get a spear phishing attachment, like I, the next thing I would expect is like a malicious macro to execute something, right? Like it's gotten a lot harder for me to embed an overt malicious binary in an email and like have it get executed. Like I have to be somewhat tricky, like use a macro, not that tricky. Um, so. I would say like the answer is sometimes yes, but often no. So we did co-occurrence. So like um, spear phishing attachment's a good example. Like if you look at PowerShell, like one of the things that we see happen most frequently with it is spear phishing attachment. And the reason for that is because adversaries are loading uh, malicious attachments into emails. They launch macros and those macros ex execute PowerShell and then PowerShell does whatever PowerShell does, right? Anything else? So I, I've got a question uh, for myself. Um, so at the top of this, you know, we talk about uh, being able to get access to the report here. I know this is not probably normally something that uh, you say, hey, give us your name and your email address and your phone number, and we will hound you until you, <laughs> you respond to us. Yes. Uh, how can we get access to this report? Is it something that... So... Uh, uh, I mean, if it's something that you want to share with me and I can share out from my sec, we can do it that way, or? So I'll give you the official answer okay. in case my employer is listening. Okay. Uh, we are going to be doing a webinar uh, on Wednesday, so like one week from today, um, where myself and three other people who are like way brighter than I am are going to talk about sort of the stuff that we learned in the report. So like me... I don't know if any of you guys have heard of any of these people or know them, but myself, our chief security officer and co-founder, Keith McCammon, um, our, one of our detection engineers, Tony Lambert, and uh, then uh, our principal intelligence analyst, Katie Nichols, who actually used to work for MITRE ATT&CK, are all going to get on a webinar and sort of like discuss the report, talk about how people can use it, like how it's useful for engineers, how it's useful for uh, analysts, how it's useful for security leaders. Um, and like what, right when we start that, uh, webinar, we will publish the report. Generally speaking, you would have to give me a variety of information to get it, but like, you know, maybe if you gave me a name, uh, if you gave me a reasonable assurance that you wouldn't tweet the ungated link, I could just give you the ungated link and you could sort of hand it out to your friends at MySec. Um, uh, I hope that my I mean, my phone's gonna like start blowing up in two seconds from the marketing department at Red Canary, like, what are you doing? <laughs> You don't have the autonomy to do that. Uh, so, um, so yeah, like we can give it to you. I was, I considered jumping into it, but then I was like, you know what? The risk of someone who's watching this seeing the URL and like going and tweeting it, I would get yelled at. So, um, but I will say that like, these are just like screen grabs from the report. That's how much. Uh,
Oh, yeah. I, I'll give you the link to that. Okay. I think, it, yeah. Um, yeah. The, the interesting thing is the top 10 from 2018. So the 2018 report, like, considered from the dawn of Red Canary until August 14th, 2018, when our CEO, Brian Beyer, ran a Ruby script and pulled all the data. And then he gave me a giant spreadsheet and was like, here is the data. Uh, this report is like the top 10 is fundamentally different than that one because one, like we detect a lot more things and two, like the biggest, I would say, I mean, I don't know, I, I can't really qualify to say that it's the biggest, but like some of the most voluminous IR engagements that we've dealt with uh, occurred like in October 2018. So after that, after we had already pulled the data for the, the first version of the report. Um, so yeah, we can get you guys that. And it's kind of cool though, because it's like the top 10 are, are pretty different. So like uh, you probably have like 15 or 16 between the two of them techniques that you could go in and just like, I'm going to read Red Canary's detection strategy section. I'm going to try to emulate it on, on my own, in my own environment and see if I can sort of build out detection for that. Do you want to talk about prior, uh, sorry, about the pricing? You mentioned that earlier. Yeah, have any of you guys, so uh, Rich just asked if I wanted to talk about Atomic Red Team. Um, have any of you guys like heard of Atomic Red Team? The shirt I'm wearing is Atomic Red Team. So, yeah, you all now, you are all now, except maybe, I don't know if the guys in Detroit are. So if you are, congratulations. If not, I'm deeply sorry. Uh, you're all the proud owners of Atomic Red Team shirts now. Um, so Atomic Red Team is an adversary emulation platform that we built. So uh, there's like many versions of this story, and I don't know which one's true. So I'm going to tell the one that I like, which is that like when we were building Red Canary, we needed to be assured that like these EDR agents that we're using were actually sending the telemetry that we expected them to send. Like that, not necessarily like we're not saying like we need to make sure that these vendors are telling us the truth. It's like there's a lot of variables that could mess up like the telemetry you get from a sensor. Like maybe we configured it wrong. On the other end, like how do we know that our detectors actually work the way that we think they should? Like the detection logic we're writing, how do we know that it's actually like when a macro launches PowerShell, if that's the detector, like how do we know that we're actually going to reliably catch that? So we built this thing called Atomic Red Team. And uh, basically, it's like simple command line scripts that emulate things like, um, you know, Red Server 32 pulling a binary down from the internet or PowerShell doing a very wide variety of things. And it's all mapped back to MITRE attack. But like it's basically just command line. Uh, actually, there's a bunch of improvements to it now with our invoke. Uh, atomic red team script that like you can do all sorts of crazy stuff with PowerShell. Um, if you follow our blog, we, we talk about it a reasonable amount of time. There's a Slack community for it if you wanted to get involved. But basically, the idea is like you can just be like, I want to see if I can detect, um, you know, PowerShell. So you click on the PowerShell file, uh, you clone the, the the GitHub repository to your own machine, and you go into the command prompt and you paste a string, and it does the rest. And like, you know, they're completely innocuous, innocu innocuous, 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 sorry, talked way too much today. Um, and uh, so like, you know, you'll, most of the attacks will like launch Notepad or pop a calculator or something. Um, but you can sort of validate the assumptions you're making about your detection coverage. And it's super easy. Like I'm not an expert on anything that happens in the command line or the, the, the like terminal or, um, your, your command line prompt or command prompt, but like I was able to immediately figure it out. And if I can figure it out, like anybody can figure it out. So I would encourage all of you to go check out Atomic Red Team, mess with it. Obviously, make sure you have permission to do this because like the first thing that you're probably going to have to do is like disable your antivirus because when you try and download Atomic Red Team, like most of these prevention tools are immediately going to be like, no, that's bad. Don't do that. Um, so like, yeah, do it in a VM that is your personal VM or make sure that your employer is allowing you to do it before you do it. But yeah, mess around with it. It's fun, especially if you're trying to learn. Like as a blue team guy, if you want to learn more about sort of red team stuff um, or just sort of learn about what happens and what it looks like from an endpoint agent when, you know, you do bad stuff on a computer. So can you mention the best part about it? Oh, man. Oh yeah, it, yeah, it's yeah, it's totally free. <laughs> there's there's no there is currently no way that Red Canary can make money off of uh, Atomic Red Team. And if you like submit your email address for 
some Atomic Red Team related content, we do a pretty good job of like making sure that we don't spam you with product stuff and we only spam you with like Atomic Red Team stuff. I can't 100% promise that, but we, we'll try. <laughs> yeah. It's these two that you got to worry about spamming you. I don't spam anybody. Yeah, it's like uh, if you just Google Atomic Red Team, there's a bunch of resources on our website, like how to get started with it. There's a GitHub repo. Any other questions? All right, well, again, everybody, I'm Brian Donahue. Uh, as promised, like if you disagree with anything I said, uh, oh my God, it's blocked. <laughs> you can get at me. You can, you can DM me on Twitter. It's, oh no, I dropped my lavalier. It's uh, at the Brian Donahue on Twitter. That's Brian with an I, and Donahue is D O N O H U E. Uh, just Google like Brian Donahue Red Canary. You'll, you'll find me. Um, so, like, really enjoyed talking to you guys. Hope you enjoyed my talk. Maybe learned something or have something to think about later. Um, thanks again. Look forward to seeing you guys at various security conferences and around the security world. I hope I didn't break the lavalier there. It's not yours. Uh, all right, so uh, I just wanted to uh, put a couple of closing words in here. Uh, first of all, thank you again very much to the Red Canary team coming out here. They provided some food to us uh, here in Lansing in Detroit uh, as, and some t-shirts as well. Um, I did want to address, uh, obviously we're here at MSU right now. Um, we'll, we should be here in April. Uh, that's kind of to be determined at this point. Uh, President Stanley uh, sent an email today saying basically events can happen so long as there are less than 100 people. Uh, of course, we're not that large, so we should be able to go off without a hitch next month. Um, but uh, they're keeping students away from campus until April 20th, uh, which is the week before finals. And then they're going to reassess and determine, hey, do we got to do remote finals or what's going on there? But uh, uh, pay attention to the MySec uh, hashtag on Twitter. Uh, you can search it publicly, and, uh, and you'll see stuff about Lansing if, 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 I, if I have news about this location uh, for next month's meetup. Um, all right, and that's it. Thank you guys for coming out. <laughs>